my bug bounty methodology and how I approach a target for the first time. Welcome again to the Hack for Fun and Profit podcast, where we explore topics related to cybersecurity and bug bounty hunting. Last time, I showed you the best resources I use to stay up to date in bug bounty hunting. Today, I will share with you my bug bounty methodology when I approach a target for the first time. This is going to be divided into several sections. First, I will show you how I choose a bug bounty program, then I will dive into how I enumerate the assets, and from there I will explain how I pick a web application and how I test it. Finally, I will evaluate this bug bounty methodology by enumerating its pros and cons so that you know exactly what to expect from it. There are plenty of bug bounty tips and tricks along the way, so make sure to stick around until the end. How I choose a bug bounty program When I first started hacking, Hacker 101 didn't exist yet. I had to work on public programs which were tough to crack. In fact, there's simply a lot of competition on those programs with the level of expertise I had. Luckily, you don't have to struggle as before. If you've seen my previous episodes, you have probably earned your first 26 points on Hacker 101 by now and got your first private invite from a bug bounty program. If you haven't done it yet, then you're probably starting off your bug bounty hunting journey on the wrong foot. Anyways, let's assume that you have received some private invitations. How would you choose between them? What program would you pick to start hunting for bugs? On HackerOne, when I primarily hunt for bugs, I choose a program based on key metrics shown to me during the invitation process. Program launch date. First, I see where the bug bounty program was launched in order to have an idea of how old the program is. This tells me whether I should spend more time on low hanging fruits or dig deeper during my testing, because unless there are new assets, most of the easy bugs would have already been found in an old program. Program Responsiveness The second thing I look for is the response posture of the program. In short, I see what is the average time to resolve a security issue. If the program takes a lot of time to resolve security issues, it means that there is a higher chance of getting duplicates. Usually, all other response metrics such as time to first response, time to triage and time to bounty are lower than the resolution time, so the shorter it is, the better. You can also see the percentage of the reports which have met those response metrics. If it is above 90%, I'd probably accept the invitation if the rest of the metrics is okay for me. The scope of the bug bounty program. I usually prefer bigger scopes. For example, I would prefer wildcard domains over a single web application. It reduces competition because there is enough room to play with the different assets, and it makes the target less boring. However, I might accept a program with a small scope if they have a great response time or good rewards. Which leads me to the next point. Bug Bounty Rewards This is another criteria I look for. If I'm investing my time looking for security bugs, I would like to have a bigger return on my investment. So, I would prefer higher paying bug bounty programs. I usually avoid programs with no reward, not only because of money, but also because the reputation you get is significantly lower. The 
the business of the company. If all the previous metrics look good to me, I still have to check if the company's business matches my personal values. If it doesn't, I simply reject the invitation. Alright, now that I have chosen the bug bounty program, how do I approach it? Well, I start with a light subdomain enumeration to gauge the public presence of the bug bounty program and quickly find something to work on. I used to do thorough enumeration, but I realized that it takes a considerable time. Because this is my first interaction with the target, I feel it's a bit early to perform a heavy enumeration. What does my bug bounty methodology for subdomain enumeration look like? I start my subdomain enumeration with TomNomNom's Asset Finder tool. The command is straightforward, you just provide your InScope wildcard domain name, that is, Asset Finder dash dash subs dash only and then the domain name. The thing I love about this tool is that it's blazingly fast. It provides me with a quick idea of the subdomain's naming convention and gives me initial assets to work on. I always avoid brute force at this stage. On the one hand, it takes more time which I prefer to invest in the next steps and on the other hand, I like to increase my success rate by brute forcing with a custom word list tailored just for this domain. Bug Bounty Methodology to Enumerate Web Applications Now that I have a list of assets, I filter only web applications using, again, TomNomNom's HTTP probe. For now, all I'm interested in are port 80 and 443. The command again is easy to run. You just cat the file that you got from the previous steps and then pipe it to the HTTP probe. As a side note, if the program is new, I would probably use Shodan or perform a port scan using MassScan to see if there are any web applications running on non-standard open ports. Lastly, I run Aquatone to screenshot the list of live web applications that I found using HTPro. There are two reasons I do that. On the one hand, I will be able to quickly spot any visual deviation from the common user interface. And on the other hand, I will get a bird's eye view of the different web application categories and technologies. This is possible because Aquatone groups similar user interfaces together and displays the web application's technologies in the HTML results. Now, how to choose a web application? Hopefully, I now have some web applications to choose from. I tend to choose the one which deviates from the herd. For example, if all web applications implement a centralized single sign-on authentication mechanism, I would look for any asset which is directly accessible. If I spot a user interface of a common software such as monitoring tools or known content management systems, I would target them first. Another example is when the application discloses the name and the version of the software being used. In this case, I look online for any available exploit. If I'm lucky, I might get easy issues to report. For the other custom-made web applications, I will generally choose the one whose user interface deviates from the common company's theme. If I don't find one, I might repeat my previous steps with deeper enumeration. For instance, I would take the subdomains I found earlier and combine them with the name of the company to generate a custom word list. Then I would use tools like OASP AMAS and brute force the subdomains using the word list I constructed. How I approach a web application
Finally, the time comes for actually engaging with the web application and looking for security bugs. It is important that you reduce the time between your first interaction with the program and this phase. Otherwise, you will be wasting your time doing only recon. In this phase, my bug bounty methodology consists of enumerating as much as possible in order to draw the largest attack surface possible. I start with mapping the application features. This is where I open up my web browser and use the application as a normal user. If there is a sign up feature, I create a user and I log in. Then I make sure to visit every tab, click on every link, fill up every form. If it's an e-commerce website, I create an order using a fake credit card. Meanwhile, I'm capturing all the traffic with Burp. It's always tempting to switch between my web browser and Burp, but I find it distracting. Therefore, I do my best to focus on understanding the business features and making note of the interesting ones. For instance, I always look for file uploads, data exports, rich text editors, etc. I also try to understand the main application architecture and defense mechanisms. This is where I revise my burp traffic to answer specific questions. How authentication is made? Does the application use a third party for that? Is there any CSER protection? If yes, how it is implemented? Are there any resources referenced using, using numerical identifiers? If yes, is there any protection against IDOR vulnerabilities? Does the application use any API? How does the application fetch data? Does it use a front-end framework? What JavaScript files contain calls to the API? Does it use a back-end framework? If yes, then what it is and which version is being used? These are the kinds of questions I try to answer when I first interact with a web application. Having a clear idea of the architecture and the defense mechanisms helped me make a better plan of attack. I might also find weaknesses right away, which are generally application-wide and have a high impact. JavaScript enumeration Whenever I have the opportunity to read some code, I make sure to do so. Since JavaScript files power the client side of the web application, I like to collect and analyze them. I found many hidden endpoints, cross-site scripting and broken access control vulnerabilities this way. Using tools like Link Finder, I collect URLs which I cross-reference with the endpoints I have collected from the mapping exercise I did earlier. Sometimes I do it the other way around. In other words, I look for API endpoints in JavaScript files using the naming convention of the endpoints I have in Burp. This allows me to save all the API endpoints into a file. It becomes handy when I want to implement some automation to detect when the developers add new endpoints to the application. Next. I focus on one feature at a time. This is where it starts to get really interesting. By now, I am comfortable navigating around and using the application normally. I understand most features. If you quit before this phase and jump to another asset or another totally different program, you will have lost all the time you have invested learning how the application works. In this step, I'm trying to focus on one feature at a time. My goal is to learn the flow in detail, tinker with every user input based on my assumptions. For instance, if the request seems to be fetching data from a database, I will try SQL injection, for example. If the user input gets returned, I will try cross-site scripting. It all depends on your experience, but a solid start would be the OASP Top 10, which I already covered in much detail in hands-on training. Make sure to check it out on thehackerish.com.
pros and cons of this bug bounty methodology. This bug bounty methodology is powerful in many ways. However, by no means this is the perfect one. It surely has its limitations as well. Let's start with the pros. Well, it's simple and minimal. In fact, it's a simple approach which requires minimal tools to yield the best initial results. And then you have speed. One of the best things I love when following this bug bounty methodology is the speed it provides. I can get a general view of the entire program in less than an hour. If the program is big, it takes just a few hours. Using this approach, you can easily find low-hanging fruits if the program is new. It doesn't require a lot of digging and effort. And if the program is old, you can still get a general idea of the company's cyber presence. However, these are the limitations of this approach. Well, it doesn't cover the road less traveled, because I'm using well-known tools with the default options without any great deal of deep digging. I don't expect to stumble upon a hidden asset or a less traveled road. That's okay for me at this stage, because this is my first interaction with the program. Usually, you won't find easy bugs with it. It doesn't cover programs with IP ranges. If there is a program which has IP ranges in scope, this methodology wouldn't work 100%. You still need to perform a port scan, which you can easily do with mass scan. So there you have it, an end-to-end -end bug bounty methodology that you can use when you interact with the program for the first time. Rather than spending a lot of time doing extensive recon upfront, I find it more efficient to first assess the program's IT infrastructure while focusing on one or two web applications. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this bug bounty methodology. If you have any ideas on how to improve it, I encourage you to leave a comment describing how to do it. If you follow a different methodology, I'd love to know how you approach your bug bounty programs. I hope you find this episode helpful. If you did, then I'd appreciate your liking and sharing it. If you're not subscribed yet, join us to get updates whenever I publish new content. You'll find all the social links in the description. You can also reach out via email at service at thehackerish.com. If you want to read hacking blog posts, make sure you check out thehackerish.com. Until then, stay curious, keep learning, and go find some bugs.